thank you very much for the introduction. I have never worked in Africa, so. <laughs> so now, you've had already three lectures today, and I'm your last one. I'm sure you're fully energetic. You ate a lot of cake, you drank a lot of coffee, and you're ready to go. So obviously, so this is supposed to be a basic lecture, and it's really hard to press a lot of information in there to give you an overview of robotics without confusing you occasionally. So you just interrupt and tell me if it's confusing, if I should change something or explain better. I have actually two opportunities to interact with you today and on Wednesday again. So this is called part one and part two will be everything which I didn't fit in part one and then some other stuff which may fit inside still. So we'll see how this works. Now, what am I gonna do? I wanna tell you a little bit about robotics and learning for robotics. And the problem is I cannot really tell you decently about learning in robotics without first telling you a little bit more about the fundamental ideas of robotics of control. So I will try to do this today in the first part of this lecture and then get increasingly more into learning things as you will see. And again, I have no idea how much material I have and how long this will last, so we'll just try. I try to make it entertaining. That means if I see that you are really paying attention, I show you movies. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't pay attention, I don't show you movies. I show you really boring ones. So, so that's the reward of the day. Reinforcement learning is actually what we're going to do on Wednesday, so you will actually understand how to model that. So let, let's get going. This is a weird microphone. Is this actually still OK if I turn it a little bit down so I don't hear me breathe? That's annoying. Good. Let's see. Where to get started? Um, once upon a time, a couple of years ago, the National Academy of Engineering in the United States, which is one of these big things which they try to make predictions and what should be done in science and engineering in the future, came up with a couple of topics which would be cool to address in this century. And there was 14 topics, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, one of them, not surprisingly, was about the brain. We should finally understand the brain, how it works, and we should reverse engineer the brain and see really what's going on so we can actually replicate this in technology. So in my world, I'm interested in motor control. Um, I'm interested, so what, what does actually the brain do in, in, in motor control and how does it actually do? Well, Fine, all of you work really well, and our robots don't. That's the problem. So that's why it would be nice to understand how this thing works so we can actually replicate this at some point. So why is this interested in motor control? Well, besides just the pure scientific interest, there's lots of very practical applications. At some point, we would like to understand, if you understand the brain, we might actually be able to kind of personalize learning for you. So we can facilitate learning. Not just learning how to read a book or whatever, but also learning how to do motor skills. We might at some point to create really cool neuroprosthetics. We may create brain machine interfaces, move on rehabilitation. There's a lot of things that if you understand the brain, motor control in the brain, we can actually make use of that and also combine it with technology. So there's actually a bigger program in the United States currently going on where people try to create some what is called revolutionary prosthetics. And here is an example of a person using a modern or very novel prosthetic arm. And this arm is actually activated through his brain, through some kind of remaining brain activity, or I'm not sure whether it's EMG in this case, or I think it's EMG. Um, it's essentially people use the, uh, the, they reroute some nerves, route it to particular muscles which are not used a lot, and then basically the person has to learn how to use these muscles to control actually the muscle activation, I should say the muscles themselves are useless, the muscle activation, how to control this arm. And this actually makes progress, and it's really cool what people can do. It's far away from being really practical, since the interfaces are complicated, and there's other people who work actually on brain imaging techniques which directly activate the robot arm. But this is one of those technologies at the border between brain science and, and robotics. Well, the other part which the National Academy of Engineering also mentioned is it would be really interesting to create a synthetic human at some point. And that might be, for instance, a humanoid robot. So since about 15 years ago, there's been triggered by Japan kind of a big wave, a revolutionary wave of, of robotics, humanoid robotics, with the idea of kind of inserting these things in our daily life at some point. And you see here a whole bunch of pictures. So this is, I have a stick. Let's take the stick. 
That's the HRP4 robot, the Japanese robot, one of the currently nicest developed humanoid robots. That's a Sarkoz humanoid robot, which we have in our lab in the United States. Um, that's a baby robot, the iCub. Many people will know that robot from because they're popular in Europe. This is Atlas. That's the monster robot. Um, that is a very novel development by a US company, Boston Dynamics. And it's supposed to be a disaster of a rescue robot. So it's 150 kilograms heavy and it's a big bastard, to be honest. I don't know how to control this thing, but people are working on this. Just the opposite, the now robots, you might have seen tiny little cute robots. Not very practically useful, but interesting for studying motor control and, and, and perception. And this is the NASA RoboNaut robot, for instance, which is meant to go out in space. It's a beautifully engineered robot. Just It moves really slowly since it has an awful lot of space, uh, time and space up there. So it doesn't have to be fast. So let me see. What can we do with robots? Um, there's lots of things, obviously. You can, at some point, have assistive robots everywhere. So a robot could run around now, serve you cake and coffee. It would be really nice. Um, obviously, it could help in homes when someone is injured, cannot move properly, the robot can help. It can help the elderly. We all know we have aging populations. Um, it can go to hazardous environments, space exploration, disaster rescue, all kinds of things where these machines can be very useful. Essentially, it's, it's, it's an infinite number of things that they can do. And we can use them there where actually humans don't want to do stuff or we don't have enough humans. And we're losing humans, at least in the, in the Western world, quite significantly. So, let me give you some examples about the vision Hollywood. I live too much in Los Angeles, so I'll have to refer to Hollywood. So, may have, many of you might have seen the movie I, Robot. The largest robotic distribution in history. On Saturday, there will be one robot to every five humans. These robots are the realization of dream. Okay, I don't go any further, since from then on it goes down the hill. Robots go wild, kill people, and get ready weird red lights. I don't know who built the red light in the robot. But anyway, um, but I think the first few seconds are really cool of the movie. This idea that <laughs> it's still a good movie, but just in terms of vision. So there's a robot walking the dog, there's a robot hugging a kid, there's robots basically taking care of the trash. Basically, they basically help in a world where seemingly people have other things to do which is kind of nice. And, and this is something, this will come, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 50, I think under 100 years for sure, maybe 50 years, maybe less. You will buy these things literally like you will buy cars. Okay, so fine, Hollywood is prepared for that. You can get the trailer. Could be an Apple product, huh? <laughs> but again, it will all happen. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. You can already buy Roomba vacuum cleaners or scrubbing things. And, and at some point, we will get to this level that you buy these things the same way as you buy a car. And they will be useful in a certain domain. The one will be the sports robot. OK, maybe the robot with which you go jogging because you're lonely otherwise. Or the other one will be the cleanup robot. And the next one will be a robot which actually educates you how to dance. So, so you don't have to step on somebody else's feet anymore. Kind of nice. Now, how far are we away from this future? We can also play a little bit what's, what's, what's going on in the world. And here's a very cool movie about the first Geminoid summit. And that's real. So pretty creepy, huh? 
So this was essentially the, the gentleman in the middle, the Japanese gentleman, is Hiroshi Ishiguro from actually Osaka, an ATR in Japan. And he's basically creating these very lifelike faces, which are animated and, and partially, uh, particularly the gentleman with the gray hair looks fabulous. Uh, again, if you look at them too much, it kind of creeps you out, but they are very cool. Um, so something is happening, so robots becoming a little bit more human. And here's another movie which is kind of fun. So by the way, this is the robot, not those guys, okay? <laughs> it's kind of cool, but pay attention, okay? The hands don't move at all. They're flat hands like this. All right, it's a lot of fun, but <laughs> um, so that was kind of the fun part. Actually, about this robot, it's a little bit more to be taught. So it, it's a very simple robot, actually. It was very hard to package everything in a slim person. And actually, the hardest part, I was told by the people who built it, was actually to create ankles which are not huge and clumpy, since women do not have big, clumpy kind of ankles, since usually you need ankle motors, and, and they are, take a lot of space. And so most Humanoid robots have actually fat legs, and it was much harder to, to actually realize it. This robot is, was completely canned, okay? There is no intelligent control. It was completely spooling back some kind of trajectories and, and, and just behaving appropriately. And I'm sure that the DJ, which adjusts the music to the robot, and the women dancers around basically adjust to the robot as well, make it all look good. But it's still cool. It's amazing what people can do. So now it becomes more dry, okay? It was the fun part, as I said. So I want to tell you a little bit about the robotics history, just to give you a picture. Robotics is a very young field, and I think it's important to keep this in mind. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the foundations of control, and then go a little bit towards learning control, but this first part is called adaptive control, and then comes learning control, and then we continue on Wednesday. So we'll see how this works. So let's start with this. Once upon a time, this thing is annoying. Um, it's about now nine, well, it's not so good. It's about 90 years ago um, that Karl Chapek, I think I pronounced him correctly, created a play which was called Rossum's Universal Robots. And it was basically humans as usually, and they created some robot. And again, this is the robot, is the human. Interestingly, the robot is handcuffed for some reason. And um, the robots are treated as slave. Actually, the, I think the Czech word robotnik is equivalent to slave. So it was meant to be a servant. And then the robot become a little bit conscious. It's the problem. Same story as iRobot. Just go wild, kill all the humans, except for the creator. So it's good if, you know, if you're the creator, OK? If you know how to build the robots, you will survive. So this was nevertheless a very cool vision. The first vision about robotics was really about that they should be human-like. 
And then interestingly, you give this to a bunch of engineers, and this is what they came up with. So this was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, was one of the first really practical robots in industry which could do things. Obviously, it's kind of abstracted from the original vision. Um, but this is what people used to work with until pretty much the end of the 80s. And then robotics changed a lot. So robotics, if you really go back, is very young. We are just basically doing robotics since about 20, 30 years with any kind of reasonable, interesting research. Before, it was just industrial robots. Just building them was a big deal. Controlling them, there were no decent computers. There was no, no, not a lot of intelligent control you could do. I tried to summarize, I guess, did everybody get the slides at some point? Do we do this? Yeah. So I just put the kind of bullets of what happened in robotics history on, these, on two slides. It's impossible to go through that. It's also a little bit boring. Um, just a few highlights. So here's Rossum's Universal Robots, 1921. Then in 38, Isaac Asimov basically created these three laws of robotics. Basically, well, you shouldn't kill a robot. I shouldn't kill a human, whatever, stuff like that. Robots are not supposed to harm people in general. Um, so, 61 was the first production of the Unimate. That was actually the robot you saw. I, I showed you a more modern version of it, but this is where it started. So, 61 is quite some time ago. In 68, they were delivered actually to General Motors and were used as industrial machines. Um, here in 1970 was seemingly the first symposium on robotics, so kind of the first little conference. Um, what other interesting things are there? Uh, 1976, the robot spacecraft Vican, uh, Viking was landing on the Martian surface, which is a kind of a robot as well. NASA has always been involved in robotics. Um, 1980, the beginning of programming languages for robotics. And then lots of stuff. I can, interesting, 1997, the Honda humanoid robot is introduced. There was a big splash. Honda was secretly developing a humanoid robot, kind of a car company thinking maybe robots are the next cars, kind of what I mentioned before. Um, in 2002, the Roomba robot was sold in, and it sold a million times. It was the first time that a, a household robot, a personalized robot, was selling in that quantity. And another thing which is, I think, exciting was 2005, when the DARPA Grand Challenge was asking for autonomous driving cars, and in the end, six teams managed to go through the course and, and, and do a pretty good job on that. Uh, but really, most interesting research really happened in the last 15, 20 years. In the 80s, there was a lot of foundational work on algorithms and control theory. And it's now just coming into our daily life that robots become looking interesting. So what is an interesting, what would be a cool robot? So here, fine, here's my personal cool robot, Commander Data. And there's always this one thing which is kind of fun to think about. Now, we have a problem in robotics that our hardware is still pretty lousy. But let's assume I could give you commander data, so this positronic brain and whatever he's built from. And so basically, he has infinite computing power and, and can do everything, sensing whatever you want. Would you be able to program it? Would you put in algorithms, machine learning algorithms, control algorithms, search algorithms to make it work and do something? And unfortunately, the answer will be no. We have no clue how to do that, even if I had perfect hardware. And this is kind of an interesting component to think about. So there's people in, in software, in algorithms, which who can still do a huge amount of research while the kind of more mechanical people catch up in trying to create better motors and better energy efficiency and things like that. So let me give you a little video from the history of robot juggling. It's kind of fun. <laughs> So this is Claude Shannon, the inventor of information theory, who was very excited about juggling. Thank you. 
Okay. So it's kind of cool. So Claude Shannon was also interested in robotics to some extent, and I think this video was taken somewhere in the 80s, early 80s, or something like that. And just to see what happened afterwards, so people replicated this machine. So this is a five-ball juggler now. It's even a little bit more complicated. And then you can have humanoids doing juggling, so here it's doing something like devil sticking. And you can go a little bit step forward and make this even a little bit wilder from the ETH, actually some from Rafa Andrea's lab. These are now quadcopters, which can bounce balls around. And they can also play together. So kind of interesting to see how over the last 30, 40 years things changed. Okay. Bad shot. So factor four sped up. I think they play with each other. I'm not sure whether it's against. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this was just a tiny little glimpse, glimpse into, into robotics. And again, just keep in mind, it's a field which is 20, 30 years old, really, in, in its research excitement. Um, so now we get even drier. Let's go to the foundations of control. So you need to know a little bit what we need to do in order to bring a robot alive. And here's the most important thing. Robots work in what is called a closed-loop system. So these are typical block diagrams which people in robotics like to use. So here's um, the robot and potentially its environment in this box. Now from this we can, through some sensors, get some feedback about what the environment or the robot is doing. And usually what we need then is some kind of sensory processing. This is usually you need to get noise out of the system. You have to estimate hidden states. So it's generally called state estimation. And after you've done this enough and have enough pre-processing, you can basically give it to an action generation box. It may actually happen also in a loop. This action generation box creates a motor command and basically pushes it out to the system. Again, there might be noise contamination on, on various levels. And it may not just be Gaussian noise, it may be annoying noise. And sometimes, well, annoying noise is everything which is not Gaussian, I guess. But um, it, it you don't know. And many times people simply assume if they are modeling errors in, 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 in their robotic system, then this is also absorbed by noise, which is a reasonable assumption. It's such a very structured noise. It has nothing to do with noise, actually. And in the end, there's hopefully a learning box which kind of adjusts what's happening here. It may actually create the sensor processing to become better. It may create the action generation box to become better. It, well, God knows, maybe figures out how to cancel the noise. All kinds of things may happen. Actually, if you, the, the grand challenge, the kind of autonomous driving cars, they mostly have a problem in sensor preprocessing and perception. So these are essentially very aggressive state estimation machines. They don't care so much about action generation, since, to be quite honest, steering a car is pretty simple. Okay, I have a steering wheel, gas, brake, that's it. Not a lot of stuff going on. While most big robots, like humanoid robots, we have much more problems here in the action generation part, and often the sensor pre-processing is simpler up to the level where it comes to visual perception and becomes a pain, and when, then you go to Michael Black, and he will tell you sometime during these two weeks much more about perception, how to handle that. Also important is, we like to work with equations. In just in general, there is in, in robotics or control theory, there's two kinds of equations which you have again and again. This is the system model, and we just write them as differential equations. And they mean nothing, okay? they're totally general. It's just x with a dot, it's a change of state. It's some function of the current state, some motor commands, potentially time, and some noise variables. And then there's also an observation model. And the observation model basically just tells me how I measure things. So it tells me what I can actually get as measurements from the world, given that there is a state and some commands and some time and also some noise components. So again, again the sensor preprocessing is mostly dealing with the observation model. The action generation is mostly dealing with the system model. But in the end, you have to address both of them. And in the end, everything works in a loop. And it's very important, and this is something 
which, well, fine, which is problematic, okay? It's a closed loop system. You may create one box which is really good, and the other ones are really crappy, and you will still fail. So if you are on an autopilot in your airplane, you want all these boxes to work, okay? You want the airplane measures properly, the speed and, and whatever humidity and weather and whatever's out there and creates the right commands. You don't want just, oh, it's great state estimation, but then basically controller sucks and go, go down. So this is kind of what makes this system more interesting. It's also if you work with a physical system in the end, like a robot, if it fails, it's dead and maybe broken or you fix it or someone else might get hurt. So I just want to raise this awareness. Ah, let me just re-emphasize. This, this new Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems here, actually, we really make this perception action learning or this learning in loops one of our main central themes which we would like to address so that we really address how complete autonomous systems can exist, not just components of them. All right. Now let's focus a little bit on the action generation box. And to start with general, so um, people call usually the action generation thing a control policy. And that's an old term from the, from the 40s and 50s, from the last century. Um, control policy is nothing but a function which maps the current state, potentially time dependent and parameter dependent to an appropriate action. So if you want to play tennis like, I don't know, Boris Becker, well, he's not a, well, he doesn't play anymore, but maybe. Anyway, Roger Federer. Um, all what you need is this tennis function. If you have that, you are in business. That means for every ball, in every opponent, in every wind condition, and any weird surface of the tennis court, you know how to create the right action, whack it over, and off you go. Totally cool. So for every task, there will be one of those control policies. And if you know how to basically represent this function and, and, and train it up to high performance, then you're done. And it's in some of what our brain is doing when we learn tennis. Just we would like to figure out how to do this in, in technological systems. Now, the next question to ask after we have that overly general formulation, which doesn't help at all. Um, so how can we basically put representations in there? How can we make this more manageable? So let's look at that. So here's the first part. We have a couple of terminologies in robotics, and it's important to know them. So first of them is what is called feed-forward control, which is a, you have a desired behavior, here's a control box, the control box puts out a motor command, gets it to a robot, the robot does something, but you don't get feedback to the controller. So it's called open loop control. Now, is that something which is intelligent or not? In some sense, what you saw before, the, the kind of dancing robot woman, was mostly open loop control. It still uses some closed loop control in order to move its joints appropriately, but it doesn't perceive its environment at all. It doesn't perceive the beat of the music, it doesn't perceive the dances around it, it just basically goes and does its thing. Now, useful or not, totally stupid. It turns out actually it's a, it's a pretty useful concept for the simple reason that all of you are using it all the time. Um, your brain has incredible delays from a technological point of view in order to talk from up here to making your muscles and your fingers work. So normally from a visual input to moving my finger is about 200 to 300 milliseconds. Now in control, this is an incredibly long delay. And if you have very long delays like that, using these kind of open loop strategies is actually a very good idea. Since if you close the loop with long delays, you can actually create instability in systems. And then the entire system goes wild. So whenever you do a very fast moving, let's assume you play table tennis and you're well trained and you really quickly react or you're a karate fighter, you actually use these open loop strategies. And only when basically the movement settles, your visual perception and other perception systems kick back in and correct. Now you actually have also some really fast, almost zero delay systems. And these are your eyeballs. They're very cool. You can try this actually out. You wanna have an experiment? So you can all do it in case you're still awake. So it turns out that in your head, there are some sensors, some gyro sensors in the inner ear, the vestibular organ, and this can actually tell your eyeballs to move with about 10, 15 milliseconds. And then there's another way how to tell your eyes to move, and this is actually visual perception. And you have two reflexes which actually handle that, which are kind of fun. So the one reflex is kind of the optokinetic reflex. So how does this work? Very simple. You take your hand in front of your 
eyes. Very good. But you can may have watch me first, otherwise you can't see me anymore, okay? <laughs> so fine, put it in front of your eyes, keep your head still, and then move it, say, at two hertz. Whatever two hertz is for you, okay? <laughs> And try to watch your hands. Try to keep the image still, okay? Just follow with your eyeballs your hand. Good, now you're definitely awake. That's excellent. <laughs> now let's stop, stop, stop. Very good, well done. Now let's do this again. <laughs> let's do this again, okay? Um, hand in front of your eyes. Now, don't move your hand. Now you basically turn your head with the same frequency as before and see whether you can keep your hand still in front of your eyes. And the answer is much, much better than before. OK, fine. This time you used the 15 millisecond. The, first, the second time you used the 15 millisecond delay loop, which is really fast and can react to that. The first time you used the 200 millisecond delay loop, and it's very slow and cannot actually follow. Kind of cool. So you have this in your body, just to tell you some of these systems, <laughs> how they work. Um, but now let's actually go to closed loop control. And this is now feedback control. It's actually what we already did right now. Now we close the loop to the crawler. Here could be a delay in there. So right now, the, when we moved the head, there was hardly any delay. If we moved the, the, the hand, there was a big delay from visual processing. And basically, now we basically have feedback from the world, and we can hopefully do better. The control policies here basically just ignore the state. And otherwise, they're full control policy. Now let's go to, oops, that was too fast. How do I go back? Like this. Good. Um, let's do some other pieces of terminology. So feedback control you just saw is when the loop is closed. So nothing special. We've just had this. Now negative feedback control, interesting, is a slightly different concept. Now you're comparing a desired state against a current state. You take the difference, and then you have an error, and you just react to the error. So this is the most standard way how we reject errors or perturbations in control systems. Um, you have that actually inbuilt in your spinal cord. Your spinal cord has a mechanism which basically does these kind of error corrective measures at a fairly high speed at about with just 40, 50 milliseconds delay. So it's pretty good. Um, last not least, you can have negative feedback control and feedforward control. That means you have this little feedback controller. And then you have some feedforward controller, which is essentially like an open loop controller and basically adds additional commands to that. You will see later what this means. But that allows you to basically deal with nonlinearities in your control system in a more effective way. So it's all terminology. You see here again, here's the error. And the forward controller, in this case, actually only gets desired input. It doesn't get actually feedback from the real world. It just works completely out of what I want to do. Let me see. Now, a little bit more. Almost done with those terminology box diagrams. Um, when people just have a control policy in a box which outputs a command without actually any additional structure in there, this is often called direct control. And the good thing about this is it's a very general representation. The problem is how to find these kind of direct controllers without pre-structuring. And it's, this is kind of the reason why you actually want to pre-structure. So indirect control basically now starts to do what we did on the previous slide. It actually tries to put more modular components in the big yellow control policy to structure the problem, hopefully to reuse things. So for instance, we have the feedback controller again. We have the feed forward controller. And now actually there's a box about trajectory planning. And we'll get back to this Oops, mostly on, on, on Wednesday, actually, how do we can actually plan things. But the good idea is now basically you hope that someone plans something and the planning system only creates, for instance, like kinematic trajectory, like positions and velocities, for instance, and doesn't care about how to activate the muscles. The muscle activation or motor activation is done by those guys and they send it out to the robot and are using it. And this concept is something which people have been mapping actually on the human brain as well. And many people believe, for instance, that the cerebellum is involved in this feed-forward control box and creates really more complicated control coordination. So why is this interesting? Go to some exercising where someone uh, throws you one of these really heavy balls, Medizinbälle in German. I have no idea how to translate this into English. Um, yeah, you get a big heavy ball someone throws to you, and you got to catch it. 
Now, if you would measure your muscle activation, the interesting thing is before you are catching the ball, your back muscles are completely flexed. So your brain knows there will be a big impact from the heavy ball, and it already contracts the back muscles so that you don't fall over. So it anticipates. And that kind of anticipation is in these feed-forward controllers, and it's, for instance, what people think the cerebellum is doing, for instance. If you knock it out, the cerebellum, then you, you're highly uncoordinated. Last but not least, um, people are also interested in modularization, since basically you need maybe tiny modules which accomplish subtasks and then chain them together to create more complicated tasks. So this is kind of, people call these, for instance, motor primitives, or they call it basis behaviors, or they call them macros in reinforcement learning. The essence is essentially you have a whole battery or a whole library of different small policies which you can mix and match in order to create complex behavior, which is a very useful concept. All right, so these are control diagrams. Now I gotta put this a little bit more in equations. Um, negative feedback control is mostly done with what is called proportional integral derivative control. So that means a feedback component of your control command consists potentially out of these three components. Doesn't have to be all three of them, but these three are available. So what are they about? So proportional control is just using the position error. So it has a desired state minus a current state takes the difference, becomes an error, multiplies it with a multiplier, and that becomes your, your motor command. This multiplier is called a gain or a gain matrix. So whenever I use boldface letters, it means vectors. Boldface capital letters are matrices. And so this should be a proper matrix vector equation. If this is a matrix, then this has to be positive definite. Otherwise, if it were a scalar, it has to be positive. Everybody knows what positive definiteness means? Yes, no, maybe, just reminding you. I think we can do this in a second. <laughs> OK, x is a variable on the real line. OK, x squared, we all agree, is greater than 0, or greater or equal 0 if it's 0. Now we just need to generalize that concept to matrices. So let's do the same with matrices. X transpose times a matrix R times X should be always greater than zero. If that is the case, then R is positive definite. That's it. It's just a generalization of squaring by using a vector matrix notation. We just need this to be, if you run a react to an error, it's important that you get the sign right, okay? If I change the sign, everything goes wrong. So let me give you a tiny example of that. So let's assume this is my goal, and I'm currently here. That means this is my error. So let's call this here x. And this is my target, which is, for instance, 0. So my error is x minus t, OK? Now, or let's actually stay with this notation over there. Let's call it t minus x, since that's what I'm using there on this slide. So t minus x is, in this case, negative. And if I want to create a motor command to get to the target, u, then I multiply this with alpha and create, for instance, interpret this as a force. So alpha is positive now. And a positive thing multiplied by something negative is negative. So a force would actually point in this direction and bring me closer to the goal. Works. Now, if I mess up the sign of alpha, then the force would actually point in this direction, and I will go to hell, which is not good. So signs matter. When I mean, it comes to matrices, of course, it matters even more that you're pointing in the right direction. If you want to go downhill, you should go downhill. A matrix allows you plus minus 90 degrees to go downhill, but you need to go downhill. Good. So this was proportional control. Derivative control. It's essentially doing the same thing just with velocities. Now you have a desired velocity minus current velocity multiplied again with a positive definite matrix. And that basically becomes a motor command which damps you. It's kind of kind of resisting you. And integral control, huh, that's a little bit more tricky. So the problem of PD controls, that means proportional and derivative control, is it cannot overcome what is called steady state error. So what the hell is that? OK, so here we go water, uh, which is heavy. Now let's assume I want to put the bottle here. 
Now, and I just use a PD controller, okay, just P and D. So ideally, um, I want to get it up to here. That means my desire state is where my finger is. If I'm up there, and I want to keep it there. Now, if I'm up there, then I have basically zero position error and zero velocity error. Okay, I have that P term and D term. Now, if I have zero position error, then the P term is zero. If I have zero velocity error, the D term is uh, zero. That means I create no motor command. That means I reach the target, create no motor command, boing, go back down. Doesn't work. So I need something else which compensates for that weight in my hand, this kind of offset weight. And this is what kind of this integral term is doing. It's basically integrating an error over time until I reach my target and my error gets zero. And then it, this is not integrated anymore because there's nothing added anymore. And that creates kind of an offset term which allows me to keep this up here. And this is all what you guys do. You know, I give you something really heavy and you try to basically push it into a shelf or something, then you look with your hand and bump it is the right thing and put it inside. So very simple control concept, but they are in pretty much every robot somehow inside. Now, next thing, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Model-based feed-forward control. So what is that? So this here is pure beauty. This is what is called the rigid body dynamics equation. And it may not appear to you so beautiful because it's hard to interpret, but it actually is very structured. So what this thing, so Q right now, people in control theory like to use Q for all the uh, states a robot has. Uh, just, I don't know why. Some people like theta, some people like x's, but let's, let's, let's take Q for a moment. And there's a big matrix B of Q, and B basically has all inertial terms. So that means all the things which are mass or inertia based. And then it multiplies somehow Q double dot. So this, these equations basically come from physics. You basically can derive them, and then you discover that there's this particular structure in them. So you discover that there's a big matrix which only depends on positions and inertial terms like masses and inertia, and then multiplies the accelerations. Then there is another matrix which basically has only centripetal and Coriolis forces. Centripetal forces or centrifugal forces, which people is, is when you go on a carousel and just turn and you get pushed out and you go in a circle. So people have experienced them. Cent uh, Coriolis forces are a little bit weirder. This is if you, fine, if you are on a disc, okay, this is a top down. This here is you, it's your head, and that's your nose. It's a terrible nose, but fine. And this thing is turning, and you move outward. While you're moving outward, there will be a force which will push you to the side. That's called the Coriolis force. So these things happen whenever you have kind of a revolute joints that things like our arms, everything where things turn. And they are quite significant if you move faster, so they are very important. And then here's gravity terms. And this all has to equal the motor commands which you're applying at your motors. Now, to make this more digestible, there's a very simple rigid biodynamic system, for instance, a damped spring mass system. Those of, as everybody has seen in physics at some point, same equations, okay? Mx double dot m corresponds to bx double dot to q double, uh, q double dot. Then comes some velocity-depending term. So this B is what is in the C term. And then comes the spring constant, which is not a gravity force, but it's also what is called a potential force. And basically, depending on you have a certain distance from the zero point of the spring, and that creates basically a force. And this, has to, the, this equation has to equal all the forces which are acting on this mass. So this is physics 101, except in rigid biodynamics, these equations look more complicated. Um, let me see, what else do we need? Need a little bit more notation. So, when you arrange the equation in the way that the commands, the motor commands on one side and all the other terms on the left side, people call this an inverse equation, inverse dynamics. Let me see, and let's make plain you why. The forward dynamics looks actually like this. This is written as a normal equations where the double dot thing is on the left side and all the other stuff is on the right side. So most robots are second order systems. That's why we have two dots on those systems. And so this is called forward dynamics. It basically tells me if I apply a motor command and I'm currently in the state Q and Q dot in, 
In robotic systems or second order systems, you have two states, positions and velocities. These describe your body. Accelerations become essentially change of state. This is not a state anymore, but a change of state. Um, so if you're in QQ dot as a state and apply this motor command, then the system will change with Q double dot. That's causality. <laughs> While if I wanted to figure out if I had a desired Q double dot and I'm in state Q and Q dot, then this is the torque which I would have to apply in order to realize that. <laughs> Just important, you will we'll get back to this. This actually makes a difference when you come to learning at some point. Um, one more piece of notation. These equations here belong to the general class of what is called control affine equations. What the hell is that? It basically, that just means you can write these differential equations by reducing them to first order differential equations to look like this. That means x dot equals something, a function, nonlinear function on x, plus a nonlinear function. Uh, G of X, actually it's a matrix multiplying the U's. The interesting thing is that U is multiplying G of X in a linear way. It's not mushed into some nonlinear term. And this is what's called control affine because U is basically linearly multiplying G of X. Now these equations are basically very nice to manipulate and you will see this actually in a few minutes how to play with that in a very, very simple example. Okay, and control laws. Nothing which you haven't seen. Um, now, a complete control law usually consists out of, out of a feedback control term and a feedforward term. For instance, the feedforward term I could now generate from the knowledge of those equations. I just plug in my desires everywhere instead of having the Qs. So Q desired, Q double dot desired, and Q dot desired. And that becomes a feedforward command. And then is my feedback command just a P and D controller using a position error and a derivative error. Again, KP and KD has, have to be positive definite in order to work. So again, this is just showing you notations, nothing profound. It's just to give you familiarity with what we're using. Okay. Good. Now you got the very, very basics of control. Some properties which are useful to know. So in the 80s and 90s and still, most industrial robots only use usually PD controllers or PID controllers. They don't use any of these model-based terms, since it's totally sufficient for them to do. How do they do that? Basically, in order to have small errors, they make these gains, K, really big. That means the system creates huge motor commands if there's the slightest error. The interesting thing is what these systems are do then, they become very stiff. That means if you try to push them, they resist tremendously, really, really forcefully. That means you, they, they feel like pushing a wall. They don't give in at all, which is pretty cool. So they give high precision accuracy since in an industry, if you want to paint something or spot weld something, you want to be millimeter precision in order to ride. You don't want to spot weld the wrong part of the, of the car. If you collide with such a robot, there's only two possibilities. Either you are dead or the robot is dead. There is no intermediate outcome. Either the robot breaks, which is hardly the case with these metal things, more likely you break and it goes right through you. And so this is why you don't want these things around you, so they keep them in kind of special isolated rooms, nobody can get close to them since they're just hell dangerous. For that reason, it is actually interesting to go to compliant control. And this is really what robots, if they was meant to be amongst us at some point, were supposed to be compliant control. You can try this in case you need to wake up again. Just take your right neighbor, push. <laughs> See whether the neighbor gives in or is hard as a rock. Yes, well done. That was a very good example over there. And it works, OK? It's quite amazing. So all of you are incredibly squishy, if I might say so. <laughs> And this is cool. So we would like to have squishy robots at some point. And the only way how we can realize that is actually with model-based control. That means we have to get these K gains down. That means we do not react to errors as aggressively. We have to compensate for errors in control by having smart models. And so we need these rigid body dynamics models. Um, they're pain. They become like easily 100 pages long if you derive them. And you have specialized software to do that. Moreover, rigid body dynamics is a concept of rigid bodies. 
okay? And nothing else but that. So if you have complicated friction from hydraulics, from wires, from all kinds of stuff, then rigid body dynamics is an inaccurate model. It may be approximately correct, but not correct enough. And then you actually need to go to learning methods in order to get better. Um, we always need negative feedback control to do error, uh, error rejections. There's nothing we can do or perturbation rejections. If someone pushes you, you have to react. It's, it's only possible if you have an error term. Very important in robotics in general is damping. It's a very simple thing. In, in, in order to be stable in life, there's only one principle which works well. You gotta lose energy. If you pump energy in the system, it goes wild and explodes. It doesn't work. So damping is wonderful. It makes you lose energy. And so you need these D terms in your control law, or you have robots which are very viscous by themselves, so, and so they have a lot of damping and friction by themselves, then you don't need these terms so much. But you need them somewhere. The robot needs to lose energy. So and as I mentioned, so modern compliant robots, which are meant to be amongst us at some point, have model-based control. Just to show you an example, what you're going to see actually is a robot dog about this big, which initially basically walks with a pure stiff feedback controller over terrain it has never seen and it cannot perceive. And then basically you switch to a model-based controller, which becomes compliant, and you will see the difference. So all these things it can't see. And the moment it steps on something which it doesn't see, it just basically tries to correct for the error and just basically pushes itself off everything. And now we put in a compliant controller with feed-forward terms. Again, it doesn't see these things, but it just gives in whenever there is something. This is kind of the little squishy test we just did. And it's amazing what you can do with these things. If you just can give in in the world and have appropriate controllers around that, life becomes so much better. You don't have to pay attention. You don't have to see everything. You can just handle those things. Again, all this is unseen. It thinks it's totally flat here. OK. Now let me, OK, we do this one. Movies are there to entertain you. This is painful for the robot. It was a very cool project. So we had a 24-hour exchange service for this robot. So we broke one, we got a new one the next day. <laughs> we broke a lot. <laughs> um, so let me show you a now more elaborate version of exactly this kind of idea, compliant control. This is the big dog robot from Boston Dynamics. Actually, this is the same which builds that big monstrous humanoid disaster robot now. Actually, the person who developed this robot is in one of our labs here, Felix Grimminger, who worked on this robot. And this is the same principle. It uses compliant control um, and some very smart control techniques, but controllers, as I just showed you, and basically walks through rough terrain. It is joystick controlled. It's not autonomous, okay? It's just very good at, at, at balancing. As you can see, it's a really... <laughs> It's quite a big dog. It's not a little dog at all. But they created an, an amazing control system around this. Now it's actually stepping on ice. <laughs> Amazingly, it recovers. It's very cool. So this robot basically is a hydraulic robot. It has a hydraulic pump and, and, and a gas engine on board and all the computing as well. And it can walk through snow. So it's actually, so this project is meant to create a robot which can follow American soldiers through rough terrain and carry all the stuff they don't want to carry. And I think the project has been ongoing for about 10 years. It's pretty loud. Well, fine. It's not meant to be camouflage and, and stealth or anything like that. Yeah. Everybody will know where you are. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, what is it going to do now? Let me show you a related video of this as well, which is kind of fun to watch. So when basically this first video was posted on YouTube, this was posted shortly afterwards. I think you get the picture. <laughs> and actually, the latest version of this actually this project has been ongoing. It's now become from big dog more or less a big cow. <laughs> it's quite monstrous. It's not as loud anymore as you notice. Looks like a Trojan horse or something like that. So it's now actually becoming also autonomous in terms of some of the navigation, so it can follow a leader autonomously without being joysticked. Okay, kind of spooky. <laughs> if you meet one of those, I, I would suggest to run. <laughs> All right, um, so this is what you can do with control. So these are very nicely controlled systems. Yes? So from the equation, it seems like the desired behavior is instead of a priori about Yes, and we have to get back to this desired behavior at some point. Very good point. Yes? Yes. I, they had various iterations of that, and they ended up with this particular one. So seemingly, it was advantageous in some kind of mechanical aspect or control aspect. I have no idea, actually. They had it originally actually swapped. It, but yeah, it's not. I don't know exactly the reason. So let me get you now a little bit more into learning things. Adaptive control. Oops. Um, what's adaptive control about? So. Very important, the control theory people distinguish between adaptive control and learning control. And the main distinction is an adaptive controller is something which changes and gets better over time, but it never fails. While learning control is permitted to fail and learn by trial and error. And fine, this is kind of like if you have an airplane which kind of learns how to fly, you don't want it to crash. So it makes a lot of sense to have something in there where you can actually prove that it will never fail. While if you have somebody who may be learning how to play tennis, it's okay if you whack the ball across the fence a couple of times. It's not just a big deal. Um, adaptive control, again, emphasizes the closed loop system. Very important. It tries to basically figure out how to create a learning system which gets better over time. Um, in closed loop with all components, but never fails. 
And I just want to show you a little bit how an adaptive controller works, since it really is kind of what we would love to do in, in robot learning. It's just we fail to do most of the time, since basically proving stability and, and, and doing what we're going to do in a little toy system in complex nonlinear systems is really hard. So the basic steps of an adaptive controller, and you will understand them in, a, in the next slide. I just want to quickly summarize them before we go there. So we need to characterize somehow a desired behavior, determine a control law with some parameters which we can tweak by learning, find a mechanism how to tweak these parameters, and then implement it and see how it, how it works. So not very complicated. So let's try to do that. So. Um, this is kind of the control diagram, which is usually used in adaptive control. Again, here's our robot, here's our controller. Whenever there's a diagonal arrow through it, it means it learns. Um, we have some kind of a model. So we have a desired behavior, which we, or some desired trajectory, which we give to the model. Out comes something, maybe transformed, and comes something which we really want to accomplish. The robot gives us also a state Y out. And here's an adjustment mechanism, which basically takes the desired and the true one and somehow figures out how to make the controller become better. And it gets also usually feedback from the motor command that was used. Um, for this model, for instance, you can have an extremely simple model. You simply say y desired is x desired. Or what people often do, if your x desired might be a very discontinuous signal, which jumps suddenly, then they run it through a simple filter equation, which smoothes that out. So here you have x desired minus y desired times alpha. That becomes y dot desired. That's a very simple differential equation to as a low-pass filter. It's a very crummy low-pass filter, but it's a low-pass filter. Good. So let me try to get you through the math of how to do that. It's actually, you will see it's not hard at all. And I have all the steps there. It's a little bit dry, but we'll get through this. So now here is why I want this control affine system. We start with those equations again, since they are, look much nicer than the complicated rigid body dynamics equations. Indeed, these are vector matrix equations. Let's make that even simpler. Let's make that a scalar equation. So I just have x dot is a scalar function of some single state x plus a single command u. So this makes the math simpler. And now we need a control objective. And they simply say we want to accurately follow a desired x, whoever gave it to us. So we're not talking about this so far. And now we need some control law. And the control law looks like u equals some s. We, we don't know this function f. And we need to estimate it. So we put an estimation, so a placeholder for the estimated function is f, f, f hat. And we put this in as a control law. So how did I come up with this? Actually, not very hard. Let me just write this down. So if I have this control system, x dot equals f of x plus u. OK, now I basically replace this u with this thing here, which I put in. So that means I get actually minus f hat of x plus x dot uh, minus k. OK, now I put this in. Now, assume that the, the estimated function f hat is identical to f. So I can, for a moment, erase this. Then I have f minus f, so totally cool. I get rid of this term. So I cancel the entire nonlinearity by subtracting it actually out. And let's assume we have no error. x minus x dot is perfectly accurate. Cancel this term. And then I have x dot equals x desired dot, which is perfect. If there's a little bit error, I will correct for that. That's what my p term is doing. So this control law is a very simple control law where I cancel the nonlinearity of the system and basically have to put in this x dot in order to get for the desired x dot in here so that my real x dot becomes the desired x dot. And this here, I need a stabilizing term. Again, what I mentioned before, there has to be a feed-forward controller and a feedback controller, which work together. The feed-forward controller takes care of the nonlinearity. Feedback controller takes care of stabilization. Good. Now, let's go to the next step. I need to represent that f. And I'm going to represent it by a linear function. And you will see lots of linear functions throughout this machine learning uh, summer school. 
usually in vector matrix notation, but here is super simple. I just have scalar, so I have a parameter theta multiplying x. And for my model, I have some model parameter theta hat multiplying x. So not complicated. And then my control law becomes now such that I basically plug instead of f hat this here in. So it looks like this. And now what I have to do with adaptive control is I have to figure out a way how to learn these parameters theta hat so that I never crash, that I always stay stable. Good. Now, what are we going to do? We basically take our model dynamics and now we plug in everything we know. We know this here as the control law and we know that theta times x is our model of f of x. And I should really say, I currently assume theta times x is an accurate model of f of x. If it's not an accurate model, my life gets significantly harder. And I'm not going to get into that. So basically, I have some error terms, and then I have to create all kinds of stuff in order to deal with those error terms. Now, I define some errors. This is also not hard. Error e equals x desired minus x. Theta squiggle equals theta minus theta hat. So this is the error in parameter estimation. This is the error in tracking. OK. And now insert all this knowledge into the system again. So we had those equations, theta minus theta hat plus x dot. So again, repeating this equation. Now I insert those errors. So x minus x dot is minus e. So I can put this in. This becomes k times e. Just a sign here flips. And theta uh, x I can pull out and have theta minus, minus theta hat. This is theta squiggle. So I get this term. And now I can rearrange that. Basically, uh, I have the x dot on this side. If I bring this also on this side, I have x dot desired minus x. This would be e dot, so the differentiation of the error. And I get this thing here, which is e dot equals minus k times e minus theta squiggle times x. So that is what is called the error dynamics. And what I usually want is that the error converges to 0, since that means I'm having accurate tracking. So I was just playing with equations. It's not very complicated, you just have to know how to play with them. Now comes something weird. I will define a Lyapunov function. So who knows Lyapunov functions? Cool. Who does not know Lyapunov functions? Uh, even cooler. <laughs> so Lyapunov functions are beautiful. Now, what is this about? A Lyapunov function is essentially just what is called a potential function. It's kind of a bowl. And what in control a Lyapunov function is supposed to do looks like this. So let me give you a three-dimensional graph. So here's my Lyapunov function v. And let's call this here state 1. And uh, let me call this the state x. And let's call this the command u. And basically, I say I want to end up at a uh, let me actually let me leave it in state space. Let me take two states, x1 and x2. And let's assume I want to end up here in space. So there's a particular x1, x2, which is my goal point. Okay, let's make this here my goal. Now, the idea of a Lyapunov function is I just make up a potential function which is always positive and never zero except when I'm at the goal. So it looks like essentially like a parabolic bowl. As much as I can draw, it's just you gotta make that three-dimensional in your imagination. Cool. Nothing profound so far. The idea is now if my control law is such that at every moment of time, wherever I am in this bowl, the next step I go a little bit down. Then by definition I have to end up by the at the goal. So no, no way out. It's the, 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 uh, this kind of Lyapunov function is designed in a way it can only reach its lowest point when I'm at the, at the goal. Which essentially means if I have dv dt, the change of the function over time as I'm controlling the system, if this is strictly less than zero, I will reach the goal. So this is, in a nutshell, very primitively introduced the idea of Lyapunov functions for control and how to basically use them for proving controllers. Now, kind of weird, huh? 
the whole idea is that these Vs, you have to make them up. It's all up to you to figure them out and then basically create a stability proof. And the interesting thing is, if you don't find the right V, it doesn't mean your system is not stable, it just means you're stupid and cannot find it, potentially. Kind of disconcerting. So there's a certain art in creating those Lyapunov functions. Not for this very simple example here, since that's very trivial, it's just quadratic functions, as you see in a second. But in really complicated systems, it's very complicated. There was actually, coming back to the intro lectures I had, you had today, at the beginning of the 80s, there was this idea of Hopfield networks. Did, did Banner talk about Hopfield networks? A little bit, okay. So it was at the beginning of the 80s, after kind of Minsky and Paper ruined neural networks for a while, um, there was this one big breakthrough, and this was in associative memories, where there was a certain model of, of connected neurons, and a physicist came with ideas from statisti statistical physics and could prove that one of these models, network models, neural network models, would actually converge and he could prove that, and that was done with the Lyapunov function just using statistical physics inside and actually was called spin glass theory. So these things actually used in machine learning and in control in many other fields. All right, so it's just now let's make up a Lyapunov function. And in this case, it's actually very straightforward. I basically make up a Lyapunov function, which is my error squared and my error in parameter squared. So I want that my parameter error is zero, and I want that my tracking error is zero. Now, the other terms are just for decoration, okay? The one half I just put in there so that when I differentiate, the, the two drops out. And that kind of uh, sigma minus, uh, what is it, gamma minus one, this is just, originally this is written in vector notation, mat vector matrix notation, and so I just simplified it to scalar notation, but kind of left it in there as if it were vector matrix notation. Okay, so if you can imagine, this is a bowl which has its lowest point. It's just a parabolic bowl which has its lowest point where the tracking error and the parameter error is zero. Perfect. Otherwise, it's just a quadratic bowl. Nothing profound. So it was not very hard to make them up. But for linear systems, it's very straightforward. It's always these quadratic guys. Good. Now we can take the time derivative. So v dot. And this becomes basically e e dot, the one half cancels out, and here we just get a theta squiggle dot, and the one half cancels out, not very really complicated. Um, what happened in the next line? Oh, here we go. So theta squiggle dot was replaced with theta hat dot. Why is that the case? Because theta squiggle, we, was defined as theta minus theta hat. Theta is the true parameter vector. It doesn't change. It's constant. So if I take the time derivative, it's zero. Thus, I only have minus theta hat left, and so you have the change of sign. Okay, now we have this. Now e dot, if you remember, we just had that on the previous equation with the, uh, the error dynamics. That's the reason why we derived that. Uh, this is now annoying. Here we go. Here was our e dot, and we used that information in there, plug it in there, and then we basically can simplify everything out and we get this. Now remember, v dot is supposed to be less than zero. And now we can look at all these terms and think about them. Now, minus k e squared, we all agree this is going to be less than zero if k is positive, and we, by definition, k is positive since it's a gain. So this here is the only guy where we know it's positive. This guy, this is the error. We have no clear the error in parameter, the error in, in tracking. God knows what the thing is doing. Um, and we have this term here as well. God knows what that one is doing. So what do we do now? Oh, we are very creative. That's the cool thing. We simply say, let's simply make them zero. This term plus this term, or with negative signs, minus this term, minus this term, is supposed to be zero. Cool. And now let's solve it for theta hat dot, which is this. That means if we use a parameter adaptation law, which simply says minus this is big, uh, what is it, gamma thing, times the tracking error times the current state x, if I change my parameters theta hat according to this law, I'm guaranteed to converge to zero tracking error, zero parameter error. Nothing bad can happen. This is kind of cool. So this is the essence of most stability proofs in adaptive control or learning control, if you can ever do that. The moment things become nonlinear, 
hell breaks loose. Since I cannot do this linear algebra manipulation that way anymore, I have to do all kinds of tricks and bounding, and bounding terms and making assumption about the world that a term cannot be big enough. It's a pain. But it is very pretty. It gives you this, in a nutshell, view how things should work. Yes. You can actually, hmm? okay, so the question was if we have a multi-degree of freedom robot uh, where we can approximate every motor potentially with linear functions, I believe, and how we can basically do uh, kind of stability proofs like that. And the answer is you can do the entire same scenario by basically going into basis function expansions. So you basically, instead of, I, I gave you this simple example, theta times x, um, but now we can do theta becomes a vector and x becomes some basis functions phi of x. And that goes into everything which you will hear about kernel methods in, in, in Gaussian process regression and things like that. And with systems like this, you can actually pull through stability proofs for complete rigid body dynamic systems with multi degrees of freedom. You have to make a fair number of assumptions and you have to make assumption about how accurately this representation can actually represent the real non year system. Then you need slack variables, you have to overcome the slack variables. There's techniques which are called sliding mode control, which allow you to kind of bang your system back into submission if it goes outside of the range which you understand. And you can actually create controllers which are provably stable within quite some aggressive assumptions, however. But it's doable. Actually, I will show you one of those things in a second. Um, so again, I just want to re-emphasize that adaptive control cares about the closed loop system and how a learning system in a closed loop system can guarantee that nothing goes wrong. This is our ideal scenario. Not that I can repeat this in, in, in large detail for nonlinear systems, but this is how it should be done if possible. What I'm going to show you next is essentially doing a s simple control system, nonlinear control system, actually very similar to what the gentleman was alluding to. Now I basically have x dot, and this is going to be theta transpose, some, some basis functions, phi of x, plus some control input. And in this one, there's also a g of x, which is then also expanded into some phi. Oops, let's call it, sorry, let's call it some other symbol times x. And with this formulation, you can basically create local linearization. And then you can actually, with local linearizations, you can do a piecewise local approximation of nonlinear function. You can also create control laws. Um, let me show you this in a MATLAB little video. This is actually the nonlinear function, which is this, this f function, which was in here, which looks like a Gaussian bump, essentially. And what you see here is basically how this function is approximated over time. This is while a little simulated robot is zooming around in state space. And these are kind of the little local Gaussian models which it's creating over time in order to approximate this function correctly. And that is a system which is guaranteed stable and fulfills all the, the components of adaptive control. It, it can be done in real time, and I'm, I'm more worried about what are these, what, what are the things which you haven't thought of and which could happen in a real physical system. Uh, but the computational real time is totally doable. So actually showing you one real time implementation, and it's very cool, this is actually from more than 10 years back from Jean-Jacques Slotin's work at MIT. Jean-Jacques Slotin is a control theoretician who wrote one of the most intuitive control books on, on adaptive control, if you want to read one, which is not just theorem, lemma, proof, and blah, blah, blah. It actually has, has a beautiful amount of intuition how to read this. So his name is Slotin. If you want to find him, just look for him on Google, and you will find that he has books and on all kinds of papers. What they did uh, in the 90s at MIT, actually, they created a robot which could catch balls and which was basically 
doing adaptive control for the control system, that means for the, con for the dynamics control of the robot, and also adaptively estimating what flying object they were throwing in, whether it was a ball or a little paper plane or something like this. I only found, found one video on the web, and that's basically from 1995. And this robot is literally learning in real time all the time. There's nothing which is pre-programmed. So it's been learning its dynamics and the flight of the ball in real time, again, with simple kind of radial basis function like approaches. And it has an amazing performance. It's still a fabulous piece of work, even almost 20 years ago. Okay, last time. Yay, good. Okay, so this was a little bit of adaptive control, kind of our ideal scenarios about what learning control should be looking like. Now let's basically switch over to learning control and give up on the idea that we have perfect conversions without trials. So we're, this was one trial conversions, what these systems have been doing. Okay, and I will primarily go into what is called model-based robot learning, and I will start this now, and I will run out of time, and I continue this on Wednesday. So, let's have a look at a bigger picture of control. And so, what, what does a big control system have? It has usually some perceptual input, mostly visual input. In most systems, you'd separate kind of a stream which does more slow processing, like object recognition and figuring out what the world is what is the, it is about, and then there's also spatial information and 3D information which is needed for control. In humans, there's what is called a dorsal and a ventral stream which process that. And then this information is given to some control system which usually has some modular control with potential something like movement primitives. There's learning systems which basically evaluate these things. There's motor command generation with some control box and things go out and get feedback to the system. Um, and you can think about what, what, what is worthwhile learning in this system. And there's a lot. So fine, when it comes to basically visual to 3D information, there's all kinds of coordinate transformations which you have to learn. And they are partially nonlinear coordinate transformations between stuff which happens on your camera image and then goes to something which is represented in, in body space. And what else do we have? We have here, when it comes to basically recognizing what the world is doing, unsupervised learning, classification potentially, and you will see a lot in this summer school on, on these topics, which you could use in order to basically see what's going on. You saw from Chris Bishop, basically uh, recognizing of, of body motion of people, which basically falls into this category. Um, we have all these little control policies, which we have to learn. We have, in the learning systems, there is something which is called value function. These are evaluation functions which tell you how good you are. We'll talk about this on Wednesday. And in the end, you have potential model-based controller, which have to learn motor commands. And the most kind of interesting message here is that there's a lot of function approximation problems you have to solve. There's also classification problems, but function approximation is, is really a very dominant topic, and partially also real-time function approximation. And from that point of view, it's actually interesting to look a little bit into function approximation and model-based learning for function approximation. Um, let me, again, give you some uh, terminology. People call forward models usually what is kind of the causal relationship between some input variable and some output variable. So this is just in general y equals a function of x. It's a proper function. That means a many-to-one mapping. And for instance, our uh, forward model in robot dynamics is such a causal relationship. It's a forward model. And then there's also what is called inverse models. Inverse models basically try to exchange x and y, and then basically people use that little f minus 1. It's not a matrix inversion. It just means it's the inverse function. And this year, for instance, the rigid body inverse dynamics is a typical example of that. So here we can actually go back and forth between these two models. Often it's not so easy to create the inverse. It's analytically not existent. Interestingly, with inverse models, um, they do, given that we 
inverting the causality doesn't mean that these are functions anymore. They may be relations. So they may be having basically multiple solutions for the same input potentially, and that becomes a problem. So this is actually nicely depicted here. This is a picture kind of stolen from Mike Jordan in the, in the 90s when he wrote some papers on that. So when you have basically a mapping from X space to Y space, so here's some space, okay? And let's assume all the points in that gray space map to this point, which is fine. So many, this is like, for instance, if I'm reaching to this piece of chalk with my arm, I can reach like this, like this, like this. There's many solutions. All of them are valid. So this is what this is showing. Now, if you try to map backward, you got to make sure that you map backward into that gray region. And if you just do simple averaging, which you just experience this point and this point, and you would just basically average these two solutions, which are for this kind of point where you come from, then basically you would end up in the middle of this line, which would be outside of this gray region. That means you would create an invalid solution. So the typical example for this is actually a little robot arm. So this is a two-joint robot arm in this posture and in this posture. It reaches to the same target one time in this way and one time in this way. If you would just average the joint angles of the two of them, you would reach up here. You would not reach the target anymore. So, yes. What becomes yes, the interesting part is now when you use learning algorithms, learning algorithms mostly average over things. That's kind of the fun part. So if you basically get a data point in this case which says um, there's theta 1 for one joint angle and theta 2 and this is the uh, point number 1 and this maps to this target T and you do theta 1 and theta 2 which is the second configuration maps to T. When you now basically try to learn this as a function approximation where you say T maps to these theta ones and theta twos, number one, and then you have another one, theta one and theta two. Um, most learning algorithms would just average over that since they just think that the, the difference between those theta ones and theta twos is noise and they would try to average it out. And then you end up in the middle. So what I just, what you're asking is essentially exactly the same, the correct thing, is you need to basically be aware of these problems such that your learning algorithm does not do the averaging that it's, for instance, does picking of a solution and you need to be able to represent those solutions, which is important. Okay, I have to come to an end. I'm still early. I've still been talking for one hour and 24 minutes. Let me show one last video at the end. It needs to end with a video at least, just a fun video which is very fast, just has nothing to do with learning, um, but it's definitely worthwhile watching about a very cool robot. And that is a robot. It's created by Festo, and it's remote controlled, but it's an absolutely amazing looking bird-like robot. I have no idea, to be honest. It is just gorgeous. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can leave that running, and we're coming to an end, and, and Philip can take over again. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, since Stefan came to an end three minutes before the end of the official slot, there's time for questions. So, are there any questions in here? Are there any questions in the observation room? While we're waiting for people uh, here to no raise questions their hands. here no questions there maybe everyone's just stunned by this video and they're just staring at the at the screen no no motion whatsoever all right uh, it's usually at conferences that means that I have to come up with a question right out of, out of nowhere no, no, oh, amazing no, no, horrible okay well, there's a, there's a whole other session uh, on Wednesday, right? So we're going to have lots of questions yeah. until then.